Well, good morning, and grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to this time of worship. It is so good to be here with each and every single one of you for uh, this special occasion, both uh, a special occasion because any time that we gather together in the name of our Lord and Savior, uh, we are blessed to be able to us virtually. There I am. Hello. <laughs> See if I still have feedback. A little bit. Not too bad. Those of you who are with us virtually, we're so glad to have you with us as well. As always, I'd like to ask you to take a moment to fill out the red pew pad to let us know that you're here. If you are visiting with us, we'd love to know that you're with us. And if you're comfortable sharing as much as you are willing to, Uh, so that we can be in conversation with you this coming week. This Wednesday, we are going to have our second wonderful Wednesday of the year. So, to say it in another way, we are having our fellowship dinners. So our fellowship dinners are back. We had a wonderful crowd this week, and we do hope that you all will come and be a part of that. We serve dinner around 6 o'clock this week. It is... One of my favorites, chicken parm. So y'all need to come and enjoy that. But I want to stress something um, because Cassie Joe and Sarah and I have been talking about this. We've also been talking with our kitchen angels about it as well. Uh, as we continue this ongoing ministry that has become you know, a time of gathering for one another, we really want to stress uh, that this is an opportunity for us to share in fellowship with one another. Yes, there is a meal And that's one less dinner you have to cook in the middle of the week, which I know is a blessing to at least my family. Um, But but it is a time to gather with one another. So you can come a little bit early and share conversation. You can stay a little bit longer. It is a great time for us to be able to come and just enjoy one another's company. Uh, For the nourishment that we receive through our time together is as important as the nourishment that we receive through the food that we eat. I also want to let you know about something new we're doing. Maybe some of you all saw this or had an usher pass it out to you. Children, this is y'all's new children's bulletin. And so we are excited to roll this out this week. For the most part, you all come and you spend the first 15 or so minutes with us before you go to children's church. And this is just something that you guys can take advantage of as I'm up here talking or leaving service. uh, There's some some games and things that you can do, but also there's a lesson in there. So parents, y'all can either read it to them as y'all come in and are waiting, or you can take it home and share that lesson with them as well. Uh, Each week we'll have those in the same spots as our regular bulletins, and also we're going to have a little baggie of crayons that we'll continue to keep stocked. So I do hope that you take advantage of this new resource. And then finally, I want to invite my dear friend, Miss Ann Marshall, to come up here. Ann Marshall was not able to be with us last week, but Ann Marshall is, she is is now in the sixth grade. She's not a rising sixth grader. She is in sixth grade, and as you can tell, she has a boo-boo. <laughs> was this dance-related? I was trying to figure it out, or was it just totally, just happened another way? Happened another way. All right, well, can I sign that later? All right. <laughs> but as you all know, every year we present our sixth graders with a Bible, and so today, Ann Marshall, we would like to present you with your first youth Bible. And I'm going to hand this to you, and if I can, I'll let you have a prayer with you. Can I? Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, I give you thanks for Ann Marshall and for the continued blessing that she is, not just to her family and to her friends, but to this community of faith. We give thanks, O oh Lord, uh, that we can know you, and that we can know you personally, and that your word 
is still true to us today. And so as we present this Bible to Anne Marshall, we pray that as she reads through it and as she studies it, that she discovers a greater depth of your love for her. May she grow closer to you by growing closer to, closer to your son. And may the love that she discovers in these words, may it work in and through her that she would use and share that love with others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so proud of you, Ms. Anne Marshall. Okay? With that, I invite you to direct your hearts and minds toward God as we enter into this time of worship. Our opening hymn is My Jesus, I Love Thee, page 172 in your hymnal. I'd like to invite you to join me in this morning's opening prayer, which you'll find printed in our bulletin. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, all of us have come to know true riches, which you have given to us by your grace according to our faith. Enrich us through the gift of your Holy Spirit, so that we might be led to utilize your blessings such that you receive glory. We offer this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
You may be seated. Baptism is a most special gift that each of us are invited to take part in. And today, we get to celebrate a very special baptism. Um, The reason that I say it's special is because while we are gathering and and celebrating the baptism of Sullivan, uh, we also get to celebrate the baptism of her father. And so let me tell you just briefly a little bit about what makes that so special. According to our doctrinal understanding, that children have a place within the kingdom of God. And so we acknowledge and we celebrate the baptism of infants, believing that the grace of God should be extended to all people despite their age. We also believe that every child is a great gift that has been entrusted to us by God to nurture and to care and to love, and most especially those children that God has entrusted to us as parents. And so when a child is baptized, we invite parents to come forward and to profess or reclaim their faith before the entirety of the congregation with the understanding that their faith covers their child. Uh, There is, as far as I know, not an instance within the Gospels when an individual child is healed in some way or form that it is not dependent upon the faith of a parent. And we continue to practice that even to this day as we invite children to come forward and to celebrate the grace of God that is washed over them as they are initiated into the body of Christ. And we do that by inviting parents to profess their faith. And so on this special occasion, we get to celebrate that with Sullivan, but before we do, uh, her father is going to be able to make that same profession of faith that he will then with his wife, offer over their daughter. So I'd like to invite the Prosser family to come forward and to join me. Now, to make this a little bit easy for you all, so you aren't going back and forth in the hymnal, I've prepared a liturgy, so you should find that inside of your bulletin today. And y'all can just come and stand and face out. Mm-hmm. Hi. <laughs> Dearly beloved, Baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Now those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. Now, brothers and sisters in faith, we gather this morning to witness the grace of God through the baptism of Christopher Prosser and Sullivan James Prosser. It is a joyous occasion for the parents of a child to profess their faith on behalf of the child that God has entrusted into their love and care. This morning, it is our blessing to celebrate the baptism of Christopher Prosser as he, with his wife Lauren, seek to profess their faith on behalf of their daughter, Sullivan. And so, Chris, I ask this of you. On behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Do you reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? If so, I do. Do Do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And according to the grace given to you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, I will. Okay. Sullivan, 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 I want you to see this. Sullivan, looky here. I want to show you something. Hey, look, Sullivan. 
We got a runner. It's okay. Sullivan, come here. I want you to see something. Put your hand down in there. See what that is. Can you feel that? You know what that is? Oh. These are the waters of baptism. Now watch this, okay? These are the waters of baptism. Whoa, is right. You can kneel. Oh, Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit and bless this gift of water in those who receive it to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives so that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. Christopher Prosser, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters in faith, our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he said, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. It is therefore our blessing this morning to celebrate Sullivan's place among the people of God through the sacrament of holy, of holy baptism. May the faith of her parents cover her in this life until she is able to profess in our Lord, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ for herself. So I ask this of you, beloved, do you in presenting this child for holy baptism confess your faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If so, we do. We do. And do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before her a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care that she be brought up in the Christian faith and that she be taught the Holy Scriptures and that she learns to give reverent attendance upon the private and the public worship of God. If so, we do. And will you endeavor to keep this child under the ministry and the guidance of the church until she, by the power of God, shall accept for herself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's Holy Church, if so, we will. All right. I'm going to let you hold her. All right, sweet girl. Mother, what name is given this child? Sullivan James. Sullivan James, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What do you say? You want to walk around for a little bit? I'm going to let you lead, okay? Let's go for a walk. Show me around. Will you, will you hold my hand? I want to come show you some people. Come over this way. I know you recognize all these people over here, but I want to tell you something else. Come here. Let me show you something. Here she is, y'all. This sweet thing, by the grace of God, is now your sister. And we promise, little Miss Sullivan, that we will take every bit of care to nurture you in the faith until the time shall come <laughs> to be on your own and to profess your faith. And I'm not going to fight this any longer with you, but I am going to let these people get a picture of you kicking. But what we want you to know is that you are perfect just the way you are, and we love you, and we gladly welcome you into Christ's family.
Now, as members of this congregation, I ask, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. May the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Now, when we were in the process of planning for today, Chris and Lauren said, we'll have to see how she does. And I said, no matter what she does, it'll be perfect. Will you all agree with me that she was perfect this morning? Absolutely. Thank you, guys. As Miss Melanie wakes her way forward, I'm going to invite our children to gather with Cassie, Joe, and Sarah as they make their way to Children's Church. Good morning. Everyone stand, please. The Psalter this morning can be found on page 810. We will sing the response at the beginning and the end, verses 1 through 10. dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For the Lord will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence, and will cover you with his pinions. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction in the place at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High, your habitation. No evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. Our first lesson comes from 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter. We'll read verses 6 through 10. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. 
But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we enter into a time of prayer, I would like to ask specifically that you be in prayer uh, for the family of Melody Morris. She is the daughter of Michael and Leslie Morris and the granddaughter of Brooksy High. Um, sadly, Melody uh, passed away a few days ago after a couple years of um, struggling and fighting against cancer. So please continue to keep them in your prayers. There will be a celebration of life uh, for Melody tomorrow at 1130, and that will take place at the Refuge Church in Conway. I'd also like to ask that you please be in prayer for the Richburgs. Uh, Miss Vivian had a fall this past week, and she ended up having to have surgery on a hip. She is now in rehab in, in the midst of um, gaining her strength back from that, that procedure. And we just continue to uh, we pray for her and continue to pray for Mr. Oscar as well. Are there any other prayer requests that you would like to lift up this morning? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we do give you thanks that we have this blessed time to gather with one another, to take a moment from the stress and the anxiety of our life, of our day to day, that we can leave that at the door for a moment, and that we may peacefully and calmly enter into your presence. And pause to acknowledge the gifts and the blessings that you have made available to us. We give you thanks, O God, for this opportunity to celebrate the baptism of one of your children. And we give you thanks as it is a reminder of all of our baptism, the place that we have within your family, among your children, by your grace according to our faith. And so as we turn once more this day to your word, we pray that you may speak a truth unto us that will allow us, if only briefly, to capture your love. That we would be sent out into this world to be a witness to that very truth. For Lord, we know that we live in a world of darkness. We know that there are those who are hungry, those who have no home. We understand all too well those who are in the midst of war. We understand that there are those here in our own country who serve in many capacities, simply to keep us safe and secure. So, Lord, there is so much evil amongst us. We pray the truth of your light would shine on the darkness and that we may be a witness to this very truth. Empower us here and now and may we bring glory to your name. For we do offer this in the name of your son Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to continue in the spirit of worship this morning through the giving of your tithes and your offerings.
Let us gracious God, for these gifts and all of our blessings, we give thanks to you and praise your name above all names. Amen. Thank you.
In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of the reading of the gospel, but I want to say a quick word. Um, I know that we have a number of people who weren't here with us last week, and, and we had a message last week that was rather difficult. And the parable that we're about to read this week is not any easier. Um, we're following the lectionary. And the lectionary is inviting us to consider these teachings of Jesus. But what I want to emphasize is that with the parable of the shrewd manager that we read last week, we emphasized the point that Jesus was not offering an indictment against people of wealth. That he was in the midst of teaching his disciples. And he was teaching them... In showing them the correlation between stewardship and faith, and more so, the blessed opportunity that is given to us to utilize our blessings for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And that's important for us to remember, especially as we go into the text that we're about to read. That's almost harder for us to read as well. And so I want us to once again be conscientious about the audience, Jesus' audience here. He's just finished teaching his disciples about this parable of the shrewd manager, and he gets a response from the Pharisees and the other religious elite who were there. In fact, in verse 14 of chapter 16 of Luke, we hear that the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard the teaching of Jesus, and they ridiculed him. And so the story we read this morning is Jesus' response to these individuals who ridiculed him for this teaching about the way in which God empowers us to advance the kingdom of God. And with that in mind, my friends, I invite you now to stand in honor of the reading of the gospel. From the 16th chapter of Luke, we begin at the 19th verse. There was a rich man, Jesus said, who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And the man called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all of this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But but he said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. 
So my father has a house at Edisto, and a few years ago, we were down there with him, and we had gone on a walk or a bike ride, I can't remember which one, but we were on the little bike path that cuts through the backside of Edisto, and as we were going along, we noticed that between two houses, there was this gigantic wall. And when I say gigantic, I mean, I did not know that they make boards that long. It had to be 20 or 25 feet long, and there was just one stretch of the fence that ran between these two homes. And I looked at Jenny and I said, I don't know what's going on there, but so, there's a story going on, that's for sure. There's something going on here for this to be the case. Just one fence riding the property line between these two homes. There's a poem that has something really interesting to say about the fences and the walls that we built. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called The Mending Wall by Robert Frost. It's really a great little poem that tells a very interesting story. You see, it tells the story of two neighbors, two men who live beside one another. One of them had an apple orchard. The other one grew pine trees. But between their pieces of property was this stone wall that they had fixed. And if you know the poem, you know how it goes, that once a year these two men would come to the wall and they would walk down the line and they would pick up the stones that had fallen and they would put them back into place. And as they were going along this one particular time, one of the guys began to wonder about the necessity of it all. In fact, he even asked his neighbor, the pine tree grower, is the wall even necessary? To which the neighbor replies with the line that is so familiar to us, good fences make for good neighbors. So the gentleman hears his friend's response that good fences make good neighbors, and he begins to consider the purpose of the wall in and of itself. And he asks himself the question, aren't fences meant for cows? We don't have any cows here. And so as he continues to go on, he asks the all-important question, before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I'd was like to give offense. The reason I like this poem is because I think Frost makes a really important observation. That there is a high cost that comes with building walls and fences and other types of boundaries. And he wants us, his readers, to consider how these features, these walls that we create between neighbors, what they actually do and the impact that they have. We think in the course of creating them that we are establishing a sense of security that will lead to peace, when in fact, Frost wonders, are we not creating an accessibility that ultimately leads to isolation? Some of us are really, really good at building walls, and I'm not talking about the physical ones like the one that ran between those two houses. Clearly, something was going on there. But for most of us, we are quite good at building Emotional walls, spiritual walls, social walls. We're really good at fixing things just so. Thinking that we are providing a sense of security that will lead to a state of peace and calmness for ourselves. When in reality what we have simply done is established ourselves as inaccessible to a degree that leads us to a place of loneliness and isolation. And to a certain degree, 
this is what I believe Jesus is trying to bring before this group of men that he's speaking to in the story that I've just read from this parable that he taught. First thing I want you to know about this parable is that it's really hard for us to come to terms with. This is a hard one when we read it. And I know that initial impulse, because I have it, is to be like, Lazarus, I totally get you. I understand where you're coming from. We're not Lazarus. And that's the first realization that we need to make. In fact, this story isn't even about Lazarus. This story is about the rich man. As I said, as we began this, Jesus is responding to this group of Pharisees who is ridiculing him for his teaching on the correlation between faith and stewardship. And the way that we have been entrusted with the blessings of God that enable us to advance the kingdom of God here on earth. And now in response to these men who he identifies as lovers of money, he has a much sharper word to say. And I think that it is important for us to realize that he's not simply trying to offer an indictment against a people of wealth, but he's trying to establish for his audience, and even for us today, the effect that it has when we give ourselves to the love of money, or another way of saying that is when we seek to serve our own interest, when we strive for the things that we want, rather than giving ourselves to the advancement of God's kingdom. The story is rather simple. There is a rich man. We hear a bunch of language about you know, his social standing. In other words, to summarize it, he was a really important guy. And he had a lot of resources available to him. And every day he'd just sit at his table in his massive home and he would gorge himself in food. Now outside of his house there was a fence that ran along and there was a gate and there was a man from that town named Lazarus who was very clearly not well off. And he would come and he would sit at the gate of this man's house for the sole purpose of hoping to get just some of the crumbs that fell from this man's table. I mean the best that he had available to him were the dogs that were running the streets that would come and lick his sores. These two men, for whatever reason, both enter into death. And they have a much different afterlife experience. One is found to be alongside Father Abraham, comforted. The other, a rich man, in a place of torment. And it's not so much for us to get into that conversation about this, what is the afterlife like, and you know the sense of dualism and all those things. The reality for us is that there is a correlation between what happens in this life and what we will experience in the life to come. And for this man, what he sought in this world impacted the experience he encountered in the life to come. To the degree that he calls out to Father Abraham for mercy. Show me mercy. And when Father Abraham says no, he says, well, then go to my brothers. So they they might turn around and he says, and I could have someone raised from the dead and they still wouldn't get it. And we know what that means. Well, In the first response that Abraham offers to this man, he says this in verse 26. Besides all of this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no one can cross from there to here. In the simplest of terms, there was a boundary. A boundary between the two. And I ask you, is there a correlation between 
the boundaries that man established in this life and the boundaries he would experience in the life to come. He was a lover of money. His use of his wealth is meant to describe this trait about him. The man is known for his elaborate house, his fine clothes, his overconsumption. He appears to be motivated by self-interest rather than the interest of others. You see, we ask ourselves this question. How will we use the blessings that have been entrusted to you? Will we use those blessings to advance the kingdom or we choose to serve our own interest? Here we see this man's decision. He's so focused on his own wants in this life that he is unable to see the needs of those around him. He's so focused on advancing himself that he is incapable of advancing the kingdom. He is so closed off that he can't be accessed not only by others, but by God. And that's where it really comes in a point of realization for us. That gate, that was the great divide. It was the thing that he had built in this life that he thought was establishing security that would lead to peace, but in reality formed an inaccessibility that led to isolation. And it's what you and I too often do. We think we're putting up walls to keep ourselves safe. In reality, we have to ask ourselves the question, Who are we actually keeping out? How am I living my life and at the expense of what? See, that's the fear that I have and the point that I bring before you today. When we seek to build for ourselves a set of boundaries, believing them to be healthy so that we can provide for ourselves. Who have we shut out? And to what degree does that level of inaccessibility restrict our God from us as well? My friends, As we depart today, there's a challenge that I wish to put before you. I want you to consider the walls that you have placed up. Whether they be emotional, whether they be spiritual, whether they be social in degree. And to really ask yourself that question. Who or what am I preventing access? What am I actually walling out instead of walling in? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite you to stand and join me as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and of Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Then should you come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is Ferris Lord Jesus, 189. Heavenly Father, pour out the gift of your Holy Spirit upon us here. Give us strength this day to go forth from this place and to make known your love. Amen.